So how can the CPSC administrator know whether a disability exists? Right now it's really rough. And now I've seen many, many evaluations from the field. And most of them that I've seen, and of course there are a select group that are sent to me, the ones that are really, really difficult, but most of them, I can't see that this child has a disability. I can't see how they could possibly say this child has a severe disability, more, you know, more than 33% like, can't see it. I'm a good evaluator. There's nothing there for the ones that I'm seeing. So the evaluator must see the child. There has to be a section on dialect and language exposure and use. There have to be holograms, like Yoda from Star Wars. And there has to be an assessment of the child's prior skills based on the child's prior experiences. Not my prior experiences, not your prior experiences, not the ones assumed in the standardized test, but that child. And it doesn't really matter that that child's from Barbados and uh, speaks Bayesian English and comes from a family of highly educated people. How many of those kids are going to be represented in, in that normative sample? That would be in your other 5% group. And it's likely if there's one Bayesian in the, what, 1,400 kids that are usually involved in these samples, I'd be surprised. Yeah, we think we can just pull that out. It's a Bayesian kid, let's give him. Or, uh, you know what? They had 14% African American kids. As if 14% representation in a normative sample is going to be enough to have it be fair for that child, right? Then, what about a child whose parents are highly educated? Parents both have PhDs or masters and PhDs. How different would we expect them to perform on an IQ test or a language test than a one whose parent has an eighth grade education or less? Yet we, assume, we act like they're going to have the exact same performance. We've got to think this through. Now, I'd want to be clear that I do think that children, if you want to see fourth grade reading level, how are, this, how are the children in New York City doing on, on reading compared to other kids throughout the country, give them one with a normative sample just like I described. But when you're doing a disability evaluation, your job is to determine whether this particular child has a disability based on that child's prior experiences not based on this uh, composite normative sample. All right, so evaluations have to contain information from the parent interview and the critical questions, especially how does that child compare to siblings or peers from the same speech community? They have to demonstrate that what was, is, <laughs> what was assessed is truly representative of the child's skills and not evidence of a gulp, gap, or cultural difference and they have to contain sufficient information and data so the, eval the CPSC administrator can see whether the student has a disability. Think the holograms. How do you bring this child to life? And I just will have, tell a quick personal story here. When I, I'm an attorney as well, I practiced law for 10 years, first a speech, practiced law for 10 years, came back. And I was going to get a PhD in anthropology. I decided to do some evaluations. My friends said, Dad, just do some evaluations. Don't keep working that job. You hate it. So I uh, was looking and applying for anthropology PhD programs, and I started doing the bilingual evals. And man, I found them really interesting. And I started to write for, write, first I was given examples how to do it, which I did for a little while. And then I started to write them and started to read the manuals and started to think about it. And I thought, you know, I really want to do a little bit differently and I would describe the kids and create these holograms and my favorite conversations were called from teams who were reviewing a child who would say we want to thank you for your evaluation because we'd actually see who this kid is and see what this child needs and from there I was invited to do talks on evaluations and from there I was invited to task force from there I was invited to do a bunch of stuff and that's actually how I ended up at Teachers College 15 years ago anyway so they matter Oh, nobody reads them. Well, somebody was reading mine. So evaluators must have a sufficient data. We have to, the evaluators have to be able to distinguish a disorder from some, and a difference. A disorder and a difference. And no test is going to do that for you. Not a single test. I have my wager with you. So how do you know whether disability exists? Well, New York State has certain guidelines. Evaluators have to quantify. So you can't use this standard the two standard deviation below the mean in one area or 1.5 in two areas because the standard scores 
are going to be flawed. And also, remember from the day one, you've got that confidence interval. Even if we lived in a land where every test was valid, reliable, and free of significant bias, which we don't, you'd still have a range that would cover more than, you know, more than one standard deviation for all the tests that you give. So let's put that aside. 12 month delay. Are you really, I mean, you, then you're using age equivalency scores, which we've talked about that. We, you, you talked about that getting your master's and doctorate. So let's think about the 25% delay and the 33% delay. A 25% delay is a mild to moderate delay, and a 33% delay is a moderately severe to severe, right? 20%, uh, sorry, 25% is 1.5 to 2 standard deviations, around there. 33% is 2 to standard deviations or greater. How do you know? You, so as a result of these trainings that we've done, now what I see is people are giving, oh, okay, okay, I know I'm not supposed to give a standardized scores. So I'm going to, I don't know what else to do. So I'm going to give the test. I'm going to come up with the score. I'm going to look where that falls. If it falls between 1.5 and 2, I'm going to say it's a 25% delay. And that's, so then, and then I'm going to write down what the kid got right and wrong on the standardized test. Or if it's more than two standard deviations, I'm going to say the kid's a 33% delay and what the, what the kid got right or wrong on the standardized test. It's useless. Just use the standard score. So at least we, I mean, it's obvious what people are doing. So don't do that. So expand yourself. Why? Not because I want you to have some kind of uh, experience, but I want these children to be evaluated appropriately. Right now, they're not. Right now, we're not doing it. Right now, we're letting these kids down. And we've been doing it for a very, very long time. OK. Well, here's that four-year speaker of Bayesian English. This is just an example of how I might write up how I'm looking at this child. Uh, the Rossetti obviously stops at three years old, but this child, I used it with this child because he was um, functioning at around the, the two and a half to three year level. So I could use that as a description. I don't like Bloom and Leahy. I put that in for the various universities that continue to teach people on uh, Bloom and Leahy. Remember that Bloom and Leahy is only for mainstream American spe speakers of English. It was developed as a descriptive tool, not a diagnostic tool. Also, if you're writing down what the child says and then says they don't have these content categories, they don't have these forms. But if you haven't gotten enough of a, a sample and you haven't stressed the child's linguistic system to, so that those content categories and forms would come up, how can you possibly say it's missing? Some CPSE administrators in desperation of trying to figure out, I have no idea what's going on with this kid, give me more information, have said, I know what I'll do. I'll compare the scores on the English and the non-English version of a test. Now, you can only do that in, Spanish, in uh, speech and language because, as we know, there's no adapted version for any of the cognitive tests or any of the ed tests, right? So, let's see what the examiner's manual says. And anytime a CPSE administrator asks you to do something, they are the expert in determining whether the child needs service. You're the expert in, in providing that CPSE administrator with enough information to make that determination. So all you have to do, if you use the PLS for Spanish, is turn to page six and seven, which says you cannot directly compare scores from the PLS for Spanish and the English edition because of significant differences in the Spanish and English standardization samples. If anyone said that to a CPSE administrator and showed that, they would likely understand. It may take a little bit of time because if you're being asked to do that, your probably evaluations are not really speaking to the CPSC administrator. I do have to tell you, I've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of preschool evaluations. I have not reported scores since at least 1995, maybe 1994. So those of you who say, oh, yes, definitely, you have to report that out there. I've done it for all different CPSC administrators. If your evaluation is good, you'll get a call to thank you for it, rather than a call to say, where's that score? <laughs>